In this video I'm going to describe and demonstrate some of my favorite JSON tools. So we'll take a look at these tools and we'll take a look at each of the purposes. JSON Viewer, QuickType, Retrofit, JSON Services, and many other websites that can list sources of data. Let's start by considering JSON structure. So if we look at JSON structure, it's fairly straightforward. Square brackets indicate an array. An array is a collection of elements of the same type. They might be different values, but they'll be the same type. Curlies indicate an object. And then we'll often have name value pairs, where the name is always in quotes, and then a colon, and then the value is usually in quotes, but doesn't need to be in quotes for certain types like number types. So we can put these all together and assemble a lot of different data representations. We can go from the most simple here, which is simply a string array. You notice the array, the square bracket that opens and closes this. And then we simply have values that are separated by commas. So this is a string array, and it's something that we'll often use in something like an autocomplete. For example, take a look at this JSON stream, which feeds an autocomplete on an HTML form. And what you see is that we have the open and close square bracket, no curly brackets, and then a bunch of strings, because the strings are essentially encapsulated in these double quotes, and then separated by commas. Now this is where jsonviewer.stack.hu comes in really handy, because you see I can paste the JSON here, and then I can go to the viewer, and it gives me a nice look and feel that describes the structure. We see array, we see strings. So that's the most simple case. We can have a much more complex case here though, where you see open curly, and then canines equals, and then square bracket. So we're taking this entire array and assigning it to the variable called canines. Within that, we have open curly, which indicates an object, and then we have name equals checkers, or name colon checkers, so assigning checkers to the value name. But then breed, notice under breed we have another colon, and then we have another object under there. So we have a series of nested objects. These types are more difficult to parse because every curly requires a DTO that knows how to parse it, and every square bracket has to be an array. So there's a nice in-between, though, which is a rather flat structure. So let's take a look at this JSON stream. And what you'll see here, this also can be used in non-autocomplete. We have a fairly straightforward data structure here. We have open square bracket and closed square bracket, which indicates an array. And then we have open curly and then name equals value, comma, name equals value. And it just happens to be the name here is label and the name here is value. So hopefully that doesn't confuse things. But what you see then is you see that this repeats. So we have a comma, we have a curly, label, colon, value, value, colon, value, close curly, comma, and it repeats. And once again, we can visualize this easily with JSON Viewer because it shows us the array and then it shows us the objects that all have the same attributes, but different values for those attributes. One more example here, a data stream that I use a lot is this plants data stream from plant places. And I could copy the entire thing, but I could also simply take a little snippet of it. I just have to remember to close the array. So take the JSON, paste it into JSON viewer. Let's go to viewer and see what we have. Very similar to that last example we looked at where we see a series of objects that have the same attribute names and those attribute names have different values. The only difference here is we have a bunch more values and you'll notice they're different data types. So we have ID, no double quote around that, and you see that screen indicating it's a number. The strings have double quotes and they're blue. And then we have a few more numbers at the bottom that are green. And then we have some Booleans in between that are simply true or false. And those again don't have to be in quotes. So if we take a look at the source, you can see several of the numbers not in quotes, uh, the true false not in quotes. That's one way we can structure our JSON is by using true data types like this. It is fairly common though for JSON streams to just assume that everything is a string and put everything as a string. One advantage of having a more defined type is it's easier to write validation rules against that. And that's where a JSON schema comes in. JSON schema allows us to write these validation rules in a text-based file, actually a JSON formatted file. The nice thing is by taking these validation rules and putting them in a text file and not necessarily hard coding with a bunch of if tests, 
we can use this schema to pre-validate data that is coming in to our ecosystem, our environment. And that's really important these days. If you roll back 20, 25 years ago, a lot of times data would generate and remain within the walls of one company. But now we think about a lot of business models that are very different. Things like Airbnb, Etsy, Uber, Lyft, so on and so forth or any of the numerous marketplaces out there where they're essentially aggregating together a bunch of individual sellers. That means that the data is getting generated at a lot of different places around the world, and we need some way to validate it to ensure that it's fit for our purpose so we don't get invalid data. And that's where a JSON schema comes in. It's also where quick type comes in. So I can take that same JSON text that we saw earlier, the plant JSON, and I can paste it here, and then we can come up and say JSON schema. And what this does is interrogates the data that I pasted. And it comes up with a basic schema that lists the data types of the data. So integer, string, Boolean, integer, so on and so forth. Just as we just saw in JSON viewer. But the nice thing is, once we have it in a JSON schema, we can add other validation rules. For example, an integer is a number and it can have a minimum and maximum. A string is a string and it can have a maximum length. So these are all things that we can add to a schema. We will take a look at this uh, schema in more depth in a future video. One other thing I'll point out is if you look by JSON schema, you see there's several other options as well, like C Sharp and like Java. And so it can generate the schema, but it can also use that to generate a default client, at least a starting point for a client. And by client, I mean the Java code that you need or the C Sharp code or JavaScript, Scala, whatever it is, that you need to actually read the data in. Uh, one handy thing here is take a look at the DTO class that it creates. And for me, this is where a lot of the value is. It's looked at our JSON and it has figured out all of these names and then it has set a whole bunch of getters and setters. But check this out. Use Lombok. I simply slide this over and it changes it into a Lombok annotated DTO. And if nothing else, this is a good place to start if you're thinking about consuming data. So that's the JSON client. And it should include a DTO to map each of the curlies and a list to map each of the square brackets. And we know that QuickType can help us create one of these. Retrofit. Retrofit is a really handy library because if we think about JSON, JSON's just essentially string data that's coming across a network. We could easily parse this by using substrings and things like that, but we'd also have to consider threading, networking, so on and so forth. Retrofit is a plugin that makes our life a lot easier because all we need to do is define an interface with a few methods and then a DTO for each of our curlies and a list for each of the square brackets. Then we provide that and a URL and endpoint to Retrofit and Retrofit hits that URL, takes the JSON, creates objects out of it. As soon as it's in that object form, it's in a form that we as programmers can interact with. So after all of this, some resources. Resources are places where we can find data in JSON format that we can integrate into our app. And this is really the holy grail. There is an incredible amount of data freely available on the internet right now, and a lot of it in JSON format. As an app developer, you can think about how to integrate all of these disparate data sources and create information that's valuable to the user. So a few that I've pointed out here, first of all, jsonservices.com, and this is a searchable list of JSON services, many that I've just seen from class projects I've seen students use. So a lot of times people ask about what kind of services are available. And I'll point them to this. Reason being, a lot of times if you start with the data, it will give you an idea for some software that you can create, an app, a RESTful service, a website, whatever. But a lot of times just seeing the data endpoint to begin with is what gives you that inspiration for something to start with. That's one thought. There's a lot of JSON uh, data that's available out there. Uh, data.cincinnati-ohio.gov is an example of municipal data that's available from the city of Cincinnati on the Socrata platform. This platform is adopted by many other municipalities. So if you want to take a look at Chicago, Seattle, and several others, you can see data in a similar format here. You simply go out and search for the data stream that you want, and then you click on API, copy, open that in a new window, and that will give you a JSON data stream. From that, you can do all of the things that we just did. Put it in a JSON viewer, get an idea of what it looks like, go to QuickType, generate a schema, 
or generate the client code, so on and so forth. So that's a look at JSON and some of my favorite tools. I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading about your favorite tools. If you have any favorite tools I haven't mentioned, please just drop them in the comments. Thank you.